colleagues, um, let's mute everyone so we can uh, start the call. Colleagues, please. I see that we have the recording on. Excellent. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good day. Welcome to the second webinar of the series Sustainable Transport and COVID-19 Response and Recovery. Uh, my name is Nayara Costa. I'm a Senior Sustainable Development Officer at the Division for Sustainable Development Goals at UNDESA. Uh, and I'm honored to be your moderator for this uh, webinar. So before uh, we begin, uh, I just want to let you know that the call uh, is being recorded and the link uh, to the recording and any materials that are shared, including the PowerPoint presentation, will be posted at our website online. Uh, we kindly ask all our panelists to mute themselves when they are um, not speaking and to turn their cameras off uh, also when they are not speaking. Um, and also to all participants, we uh, ask you to please um, use the chat box and the Q&A boxes for comments uh, and suggestions and for any um, resources you would like to exchange with the participants of this webinar. Um, we, you can tweet about this uh, webinar using our um, account um, tagging us on Twitter. It's at SUSTDEV. You can also see on the screen. And we, can, we will also be using the hashtag, uh, hashtag sustainable transport. So without further ado, let's start with uh, the introductory uh, and welcoming remarks of the session. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Shantanu Mukherjee, Chief of the Integrated Policy Analysis Branch at the Division for Sustainable Development Goals of DESA for his uh, introductory remarks. Mr. Mukherjee will also introduce the high-level speaker uh, follow, uh, following him. Uh, Mr. Mukherjee, please, you do have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Naira, and uh, a very good day to everybody. On behalf of DESA, I would first like to begin by thanking participants for joining the second part of our webinar, Sustainable Transport and COVID-19 Response and Recovery. Uh, as many of you know, the Division for Sustainable Development Goals in UN DESA actively promotes sustainable transport and leads preparations, for example, for the forthcoming Secretary General's second Global Sustainable Transport Conference to be held in Beijing, China. In light of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this conference is now on hold and new dates are currently being discussed. I would like to encourage everybody to consult the conference website for updates. Now, while much about how this pandemic will evolve remains to be seen, at this moment, we are seeing the global experience play out along two distinct paths. On the one hand, many countries and regions have successfully battled the spread of the virus and are cautiously feeling their way out of the restrictions on travel and economic activity that, although painful, were necessary to reach this stage. On the other hand, in many other countries and regions, daily case numbers are increasing, sometimes at an accelerating rate. Clearly, therefore, our two-part webinar is happening at a crucial moment when we are definitely not out of the woods as yet, but we do have some experience to be able to make more informed assessments and plan for the future, no matter how unpredictable it may appear to be. Such thinking is essential when we talk about recovery and of implementing the structural changes in this period that could put us all on accelerated pathways for meeting the SDGs and the goals of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The first part of the webinar held just a week ago provided a look at some of the key issues in this context. We heard about the experience of China and Germany as they move forward out of the immediate crisis response, and also from practitioners and experts about what the pandemic means for people and for planet in the context of sustainable transport. Over the last two decades in particular, stronger transport links within and across countries have facilitated the growth of more diversified economies and enabled hundreds of millions to emerge from poverty 
and to access services that enhance their well-being. At the same time, emissions continue to increase, especially from transport. In 2019, they accounted for about a quarter of all energy-related CO2 emissions. And if you look at what's happening during the pandemic, about half of the decline in CO2 emissions during the pandemic is estimated as due to service transport. So these two issues of people and planet are central to any discussion we have on options for sustainable transport in the context of recovery from the pandemic. Today, we visit these issues again, but through very complementary and yet quite distinct panels. In the first, we focus on countries in special situations for all of whom transport links are fundamental to development. In the second, we will look at forward-looking innovations and solutions for sustainable transport. I'm delighted to have here on this webinar the presence of several distinguished speakers whose experiences will prove invaluable to us. I'm also very happy to have you and colleagues joining us as lead discussants or respondents during the interactive dialogue. And I understand that the list of those seeking the floor is also a pretty long one. All of us here are looking forward to hearing your ideas, views, and recommendations. Without further ado then, I would like to invite the Under Secretary General from the UN Office of the High Representative of the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States, Ms. Fakita Utoi Kamanu, to deliver her remarks. Ms. Utoi Kamanu, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, delegates, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you uh, to our webinar. This is our second webinar organized by UNDESA on sustainable transport and COVID-19 response and recovery. As your high representative for LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS, I very much welcome and support this session on the impact of COVID-19 on countries in special situations. I look forward to the sharing of both the challenges, but also experiences to date with the representatives from LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDS. Pandemics, by their very definition, know no borders, no race, no religion. Everyone is affected. It is the way in which we get affected that vary. We are only begging to understand and see the far-reaching and complex social, economic, institutional, and political impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 crisis is a development crisis. The crisis will have disproportionate impacts on the most vulnerable peoples and countries in the world. The constraints, if not reversals, of growth and development will be felt hardest in the LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDS. It is due to factors such as their small size, limited levels of diversification, structural challenges, and vulnerability to external shocks. The group of LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDS accounts for 91 countries, or almost half of the United Nations membership, and around 16% of the world's population. Now contrast this with their export accounting for just around 2% of global exports. LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS already prior to the pandemic faced complex challenges to their inclusive and sustainable development and integration into the global economy. They have been hit hard by COVID-19 and had to continue to have to uh, focus on combating its spread. This means already scarce resources and limited fiscal capacity have had to even uh, been further stretched. Supply chains have been disrupted. Internal and external restrictions on movements of people have been introduced and borders and airports have uh, been shut down. Take the SIDS. With the closure of borders, many of the more remote small island communities are simply cut off and have become increasingly vulnerable. Travel and related restrictions have triggered almost insurmountable hurdles to address the negative shocks such as the most recent Category 5 cyclone Harold in the Pacific, a cyclone which has greatly affected lives, livelihoods, and infrastructure in the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, and my own country, Tonga. A main source of revenue is tourism. 
international tourism has come to a halt. At this stage, nobody knows if and when we may return to tourism levels we had prior to the pandemic. Recent data from the airline industries, for example, or those from the sea travel show that we cannot hope for speedy recovery. Even where borders remain open, it is new and additional controls slowing down trade and the distribution of goods. This greatly impacts, in particular, the landlocked developing countries. They highly rely on transit of goods through neighboring countries. So it is across the entire spectra of the economy, from industry to service to agriculture, and including the transport sector, that we can see major disruptive impact. Needless to say, the impact on employment and thus livelihoods is enormous. And in most instances, there is no fiscal or monetary space for social security provision. The estimates of the global effects are sobering. For example, world trade is set to decline by between 13 to 32% in 2020. International tourist numbers could fall between 60 to 80% in 2020. Beyond any doubt, we now see reversals of the progress made in these countries towards the achievement of the SDGs and their dedicated programs of action. We already knew prior to the advent of COVID-19 that the LDCs, LLVCs, and SIDS would face major challenges in providing adequate access to affordable transport services and in advancing sustainable transport solutions. For these countries, transport is a key precondition of sustainable development. It is a domestic must and a conduit for international trade. It is now that we must invest in efficient transport systems and innovative solutions in the transport sector. It all goes back to the old uh, question of getting people and produce uh, to markets and services. Infrastructure investment has the potential to alleviate impacts from the COVID-19 and help countries recover better. Just look at the key role of transport in ensuring delivery of much needed medical supplies, food and other necessary goods within and to affected countries. Supply chains and transport networks for goods in particular to vulnerable countries need to remain open and must be functional and functioning. For this to work, global and regional collaboration on transport connectivity have a key role to play. It is a collaboration that we must enhance to ensure that we do not further ex exclude the most vulnerable countries from international trade. Value chains are globalized by now and therefore interconnected. They rely on cross-border transport systems. It is self-evident that our responses therefore must be coordinated. The pandemic response has shown a very high digital element, be it in schooling, telemedicine, teleworking, or online ordering of goods or food. But we know the high degree of inequality in resorting to such solutions. So it is now that we must invest in countries' capacity to be able to take advantage of existing digital solutions so that they, they can limit physical contact during border clearance processes and in the trans, transit of goods. The solutions for electronic information exchange or electronic cargo tracking are available and it is access that is the issue. The time is now for capacity building and technical assistance to be provided to the most vulnerable group of countries in support of the use of new technologies and innovations in the transport sector. Looking to recovery, the transport sector can be a drive of economic growth post-COVID-19. Strong mitigation and recovery plans are urgently needed to support the safe opening of passenger transport and the tourism sector so that it can again generate jobs and return across the um, whole economy. The current crisis also bears an opportunity. It is an opportunity to make the transport sector more sustainable and accelerate our efforts to make transport more climate and environment friendly. This must include enhancing sustainable energy sources needed for moving goods and people. Take, for example, the Euro-Asia region. There has been an increase in the use of railway transport. It is an efficient means for transporting people and goods, especially when new clean energy means are used. In this way, environmental benefits can be derived, but it also is a means to make cross-border um, trans, 
um, transport systems more efficient. Now is the time to maintain and scale up our actions in investing in innovative transport solutions in response to the pandemic, and we must do it smartly. We must integrate support to climate action and the achievements of the other SDGs in our solutions. The transport system must be more resilient to the impacts of external shocks, whether it be climate change, natural disasters, or situations similar to COVID-19. The current reality is that COVID-19 pandemic forced and forces countries to make hard choices between short-term and medium to long-term investments. This means diverting investments uh, meant for transport infrastructure development towards buying the emergency supplies needed for the fight against COVID-19. As we enter the recovery period, it is important to ensure that transport infrastructure development gets the priority investment it deserves and that resources are mobilized. UN OHR LLS will continue to advocate for enhanced transport connectivity for the LDCs, LLDCs and kids and accelerated transport-related response to the COVID-19 crisis. We have already joined forces with other UN system agencies and other organizations to call for action during the COVID-19 crisis and recovery. We issued joint statement with UNCTAD and the UN Regional Commissions for Africa, Europe, Asia, and Latin America, calling for smooth trans transit and transport facilitation from LLDCs, as well as a joint statement with the World Customs Organization calling for improved transit facilitation. I hope our webinar helps in the exchange of best practices and solutions that can help the transport sector respond to the challenges of COVID-19 and build back better for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, USG Victoria Kamano, for joining us and for also conveying so much of value in so short a time. Uh, I would like now, I'd like now to hand the floor back to Naira, my colleague, as she will be guiding us through the rest of the meeting. Over to you, Naira. Thank you very much, Shantanu. So we will now start our first panel, which will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on countries in special situations and forward-looking transport solutions. Uh, we have three speakers. Uh, and two discussants on this panel. And I will kindly ask all speakers to keep to the seven minutes limit. And lead discussants, you have three minutes. And considering that we have a, a full agenda today and we started a little late, uh, I need to be a, a little bit strict on the time. I will be showing you a sign when uh, you have one minute to wrap up. Uh, and so, um, and do in the meantime, I encourage all the participants to use the chat box and the Q&A boxes uh, for your comments, suggestions, questions. And I invite the panelists uh, to keep an eye on the, um, on the chat box as well, so you can uh, reply directly to some of the questions uh, targeted to you. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Her Excellency Mrs. Louise Michelle Young, Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of Belize to the United Nations to deliver her remarks. Uh, Your Excellency, please, you do have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naira. Good morning, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Dessa, Undessa, UN DESA for the invitation to participate in this webinar series and to speak to two issues. Firstly, how SIDS have been impacted by COVID-19, particularly in the transport sector, and secondly, solutions proposed by SIDS on sustainable transport. Uh, colleagues, a precursor to this discussion actually took place in April of this year, 2020, when Belize, as the chair of AOSIS, hosted the Placentia Ambition Forum. The PATH, for short, brought together SIDS and major climate actors to discuss and highlight areas where further work is needed to support raising ambition. One of the key areas discussed at length was decarbonization and resilience building in the transport sector of SIDS, as well as the immediate impacts of COVID-19 on island economies. Transport networks are a primary entry point to SIDS vulnerability. These physical corridors 
enable SIDS to sustain their economies and maintain social cohesion. For land transport, major infrastructure makes up a large part of public assets. And when small nations face immense infrastructure, that infrastructural damage due to floods or storms on a periodic basis, governments are faced with having to pick up the pieces and take quick measures to restore mobility. More often than not, in that moment of rehabilitation, they must do so with limited or no means to, quote, climate-proof major road networks. In addition to land transport, on the domestic front, sustainable maritime transport is also uniquely important for SIDS in order to maintain con connectivity among scattered islands and to move goods and people between them. On the international front, with many undiversified economies, we are heavily reliant on international trade for energy production and, and other basic consumer needs. The infrastructure needed for these two strands of connectivity is so essential that it must be made resilient. In SIDS particularly, the adaptation of these highly vulnerable transport networks is often ignored as compared to mitigated transport initiatives, which focus on a longer time trajectory. COVID-19 laid bare our vulnerabilities, and it, we are to be better prepared for climate-related system disruption. There needs to be an equal weighting of mitigation and adaptation. Here are some key examples of where SIDS have set goals in sustainable transport. Even before COVID-19, many SIDS had strong national policies and targets for the integration of sustainable transport in their national plans. Some of us even had projects on the way. For example, Barbados had committed to 100% renewable energy and being a carbon neutral island by 2030. And one short term goal is to convert the government fleet in Barbados to electric vehicles. Nauru has enhanced both their port accessibility, economic stability, and climate resilience through the development of a fully climate resilient port. And Cabo Verde. According to Cabo Verde's electric mobility policy, all vehicles should be electric by 2050, 54% by 2030. They are currently at 17%. Singapore, Singapore has a sustainable land transport system, internal combustion engine, ve engine vehicles to be completely phased out by 2040. Uh, they also introduced a walk cycle ride so that anywhere in the city can be reached within 40 minutes and in towns within 20 minutes. And the Maldives, Maldives has a high speed public ferry network for inter island transport, transport, utilizing fuel efficient standardized hybrid boats, and with major co benefits to accelerate social and economic growth and achieve other um, sustainable development goals. But despite this having ambitious sustainable transport initiatives in our national plans and policies, the onset of COVID-19 has for many of us unraveled a plethora of unforeseen impacts to our economies and existing plans and work on the way. Um, this, the, the, the Maldives project has, the Maldives has had to delay the implementation of the high-speed public ferry because funds had to be diverted from the project to meet emergency expenses occasioned by COVID-19. Um, this is usual in our countries, having to divert funds from development to address emergencies. Um, it, it, is, it is typical of the difficult balancing positions that increasingly find themselves in as the impact of climate change rapidly continues, continues to worsen. For many cities, the main or primary economic sector is the tourism industry. We've heard that said so many times. On average, the tourism sector accounts for almost 30% of this economy. And the sudden, deep, and likely prolonged downturn in travel tourism has brought sweeping financial insecurity to those countries. Um, so I'll skip through because I see I have one minute left and I'll, I'll go to the, to the end of the solutions part. Notwithstanding the immense financial burden, 
there, there have been there are significant opportunities for increased action for both land and maritime transport. Um, the deployment of low carbon technologies is key, but it's hampered by the small size of our market. So we need approaches that can build economies of scale, approaches that build economies of scale. Increasing the uptake of both sustainable and resilient transport will require targeted policies and capacity building to develop plans that are appropriate for the SIDS and also for each small island state. Because SIDS are not homogeneous with physical variations and very different infrastructure. Um, sorry, means to scale up. There are some other things. I think I have a few more paragraphs left. Um, I think we'll post these and I am going to, to simply end by saying to make, we need to make a strong argument for the benefits that go beyond greenhouse gas emissions, including how transport projects can increase energy security, resilience, decrease costs to government and society, and increase social cohesion. We have so much work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Young, uh, for your words. Um, now, I would like to invite uh, His Excellency Mr. Gansan Bandari, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal to the United Nations to deliver his remarks. Ambassador Bandari, please, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Your our Excellency, the USG and High Representative, Your Excellency's distinguished participants. I thank you and DESA for organizing this timely webinar and inviting me to participate uh, and speak a few words in this event. During my presentation, I will focus uh, particularly on two major points. One, on the impact of COVID-19 on transport and travel and its cross-cutting impact on other sectors, and two, uh, on some way forward in terms of how sustainable transport solutions can be reimagined uh, in the response and recovery periods. First, on transport and travel, uh, needless to say that COVID-19 has had has led to disruptions in people's lives, livelihoods, and economy. And it has disrupted transport connectivity, ranging from domestic road networks, mass transportation, international travel, and cross-border fra uh, freights. The International Transport Forum has estimated that the global freight transport would fall by about 36% in 2020. ILO reports suggest that all means of public and pri private transport are affected in one way or the other. And as it was highlighted by the previous speakers, tourism yeah. sector is one of those sectors which has been hugely impacted because of COVID-19 and its restrictions uh, pertaining to travel and transport. Aviation is uh, definitely one of the sectors which is hardest hit by COVID-19, with many countries closing their borders and suspending international air travel. These disruptions and upheavals and uh, restrictions in travel and transport have led to the impact in various other sectors. For example, with regard to employment, many people and workers in the transport industry are either losing jobs or are pushed out of uh, their work. Loss of jobs also has to do with people um, you know, tending to work from home, telecommuting, e-learning, walking, and bicycling. And it becomes particularly important for the countries like LDC, LLDCs, and states, the countries in special situation, because uh, most of the workers in these, in these uh, sectors are the ones who are outside labor and employment uh, protection laws. So they are in the informal, um, they are the informal workers, so to say. Uh, to cite an example of Nepal, three in every five people who are working in small or micro enterprises in tourism, entertainment, and transport sectors have been hit uh, quite hard, and they are pushed out of jobs because of COVID-19. Uh, the production and food security uh, also is another sector which has been uh, heavily affected because of the disruptions in supply chains and labor movements. Uh, the food security problem for the countries like LDC, LLDCs, and states has become a, a, a concern, a serious concern. Uh, it has to do with both financial and institutional resources that these countries lack, and uh, the disruptions have led to uh, the rising food prices, especially in the in the urban areas. 
The disruption in transport and closure of borders, health and hygiene measures have also uh, led to the fall, steep fall in fact of, of international trade. WTO projects that about 13 uh, to 32 percentage of merchandise trade will, uh, will be you know, decreased in 2020. So the overall if, uh, impact of these uh, restrictions and changes that have, we have seen in transport and travel will be felt in the revenue generation, both in the case of firms and companies and also in the case of the governments. In fact, the road freight operators will see up to 40% decline in their revenue generation and International Air Transport Association suggests that it will have 44% decline in aviation uh, and passenger revenue. So when it comes to these impacts, uh, when it comes to these impacts with regard to LDCs and LRDCs, these countries will have disproportionate burden as they depend on external markets for essential goods, trade revenues, tourism, and remittances. And the disruptions in transport sector have ensured in the collapse of tourism, fall of remittances, and spike in unemployment in these countries. So as the USC uh, highlighted earlier, uh, earlier the this crisis may very well turn into a development crisis if uh, certain sustainable solutions are not uh, sought out. With regard to the links of this um, crisis to sustainable development, uh, Agenda 2030, uh, 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals and Paris Agreement, we need to understand that the goal related to sustainable transport, which is SDG 11.2, is not a standalone goal. It is intricately linked to the goals such as goals related to energy, which is SDG 7, human settlement, sustainable consumption and production, and climate action, which are SDG 11, 12, and 13, respectively. So the failure to needs, uh, failure to deliver on the needs of sustainable transport will have definitely a negative impact on the overall economic growth of these countries and their aspiration to achieve 2030 agenda. The hardest hit will, of course, be uh, the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and uh, the states and uh, poor people and the most vulnerable groups of people. As a way forward, I would just uh, like to highlight two major points. We know that, uh, uh, we know that uh, the transport sector contributes about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions and the lockdown measures and the global shutdown, so to say, has uh, led to the improvement in air quality. But this is very much likely to be reversed when we have uh, the resumption of traffic and also when we uh, see the lockdown measures being lifted. So there might be two options. One, investing in the public uh, transport sector in an innovative way or going to the electric vehicles, which will, uh, we will see uh, in rise when we return to normalcy. And number two, the trade facilitation measures, both by LDCs, uh, LLDCs and SEEDs, and also their partners, transit countries, need to be implemented with focus, of course, on digital technologies and paperless solutions. And finally, a uh, stimulus package from the international community, which includes, of course, helping the transition of these countries into electric vehicles and green economy, and an enhanced level of financial support with an easy access to climate finance and offering analytical and methodological tools and best practices to support the capacity building will be absolutely critical. I will stop here and I'll be happy to come back if uh, there are further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, we are going to uh, move forward. Our next uh, guest is Mrs. Irene Tengbo, Chief Planner of the Ministry of Transport and Communications from Zambia. Mrs. Tembo, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. All protocols observed. For Zambia, when the coronavirus uh, pandemic grown up, uh, uh, came up, the outbreak in December 2019, we thought it was far-fetched. The threat of COVID-19 was not evident, even after it was uh, declared a global public health emergency and upgraded to a pandemic due to its wide and continued global spread. The two cases of COVID-19 in Zambia were recorded on 18th March, 2020. Thereafter, more cases came up necessitating government to act to curb the spread of the pandemic. Among the restrictions imposed 
where the ban on non-essential travel to all countries and controlled movement of goods and persons across borders, including the shutting down of three international airports. Zambia was cognizant of the fact that a delicate balance had to be found in the border control measures to prevent the spread of the virus while ensuring continuity of economic activities and preservation of supply chains. Hence the need for an obstructed transportation of goods and provision of services to maintain their availability. SADC member states developed regional guidelines on harmonization and facilitation of cross-border transport operations across the region and standard operating procedures for the management and monitoring of cross-border road transport at designated points of entry. Initially, focus was placed on the movement and clearance of essential goods, but with the realization that COVID-19 will be with us for some time, a revision was made to include all goods. National transport emergency guidelines were also developed. COVID-19 has had a negative impact on the economy due to loss of employment, income, and in some cases, loss of business. However, the full impact is yet to unfold, but we are certain that the pandemic will halt the achievements reported during the midterm review of the Vienna Program of Action for LLDCs for the decade 2014 to 2024. The attainment of the 2030 Agenda for SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change will also be affected. We will definitely encounter challenges in the attainment of sustainable transport with regard to access, affordability, safety, security, and environmental impact. We have observed an increase in government spending due to the unforeseen COVID-19 expenditure and there has been a reduction in revenue collection. The transport sector will be affected in that there will be limited resources for the development uh, and interconnectivity of the four modes of transport and for regional corridor development as well. We have engaged cooperating partners to assist in the review of the institutional mandate for the road sector agencies. Zambia is also in the process of finalizing the road sector investment plan. Zambia is also striving to ensure road safety, although a reduction in the number of fatalities and stability in road traffic crashes has been reported. It appears we may not achieve SDG 3.6. Climate change has also contributed significantly to challenges faced in the transport sector. For instance, the northern part of the country experienced unusual heavy rains from January to April this year, resulting in heavy floods and many rivers bursting their banks. A lot of transport infrastructure, such as roads and bridges, were damaged and thereby cutting off certain areas. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have observed the greater use of ICTs in transport, transit procedures, as well as access to international markets. In responding to uh, COVID-19, we have uh, observed long queues at borders and congestion. Therefore, we feel that if ICTs were developed more, this could be a thing of the past. Zambia, in conjunction with neighboring countries and with the assistance of the international community, needs to invest more in digital technologies for efficiency and reduce on physical contact at borders. This will also help in reducing transport costs and avoid um, the escalating cost in commodities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nemo. Uh, we are moving now to our lead discussants, who will have a maximum of three minutes each, and perhaps uh, a little uh, less, if possible. First, let me invite uh, Mr. Jan Hoffman 
Let me just move the slide. Mr. Jan Hoffman, Chief of the Trade Logistics Branch at the Division on Technology and Logistics of UNCTAD to deliver his remarks. And okay, you have the presenter uh, right. So over to you, Mr. Hoffman. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, excellent to be here. And in terms of feedback on these excellent three lead discussions, I just have two couple of, of slides like comments to to support what, what has been said. And basically, this um, um, panel is about the two aspects of, um, of, of the impact COVID and transport. One is the, the impact on the country of transport, and the other one is transport as a solution. So if I have just two illustrations with data on how transport and trade and our business is affected by COVID. Here we have hard data until last week on the different ship types, for example, that we are monitoring. And you see this, the one that has gone down most, the, the brown line, are the passengers. Then the one that has also gone down, consumption, oil, dry bulk, and the one that has slowly coming back, but all still below last year's values is container. If you want to look this up for your country, coastal countries, in this case, you can see in one beautiful moving map three things. You see the relative size of the port calls, container ships of each country. Second, you see if it's going up or down. And by the color, you can see the comparison to last year, pre-COVID same period. So basically, all countries started in green then most turned red, being below last year, and some, including, for example, uh, China, has come back to green in terms of container costs. So this is some hard data, and if we had more time, I could share a lot, but you will have this presentation with some links on this. Now, the second part is how transport is important to overcome the crisis. Uh, here we have a policy brief in all six UN languages where we go along the entire supply chain, from the ship to the port, leaving the port, transit, border crossing, with very concrete proposal solutions, which um, yeah, uh, have, have one key message that I want to highlight here. Uh, often you talk and think about balances, like either you protect the population or you facilitate trade. And actually the long list of very specific solutions that we have been selling, and we are working, uh, just looking at it's like Belize, Nepal, Zambia, we are working on all these countries with ASICUDA, with trade information portals, with pre-arrival processing, um, with uh, dematerialization, digitalization. So all these help to achieve both, protect our population and transport workers and facilitate trade and transport. And this, these files and some other slides will be shared with you afterwards for further information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hoffman. And perhaps if you if you are uh, able to share the links on the chat box as well, so colleagues can also start checking on the information you are sharing. Uh, our last mm -hmm. present of this panel uh, is Mr. Kazu Jige Endo, uh, Director of the United Nations Center for Regional Development, UNCDRD. Uh, Mr. Endo, please, you have the floor and you have three minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nayara. Uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so thank you for opportunity, uh, the opportunity the transport uh, webinar uh, organized by DESA. Uh, so since I have uh, three minutes, I deliver two key messages. The first uh, message is, is on how uh, COVID-19 has impacted transport. Uh, the COVID-19 impacts are huge and uh, complicated, and also there are impact on uh, policy measures such as uh, economic development of landlocked countries, uh, as, uh, <coughs> as we discussed before. So such impact uh, should be studied in a very comprehensive, uh, compre com comprehensible manner. So because of uncertainty about this uh, the, the virus and uh, its long-term impact, so such studies require advanced knowledge uh, in transport sector. Uh, so I, I found one study result that uh, the World Conference of uh, Transport Research uh, called the WCTR has conducted a questionnaire survey of transport experts. The survey was conducted 
uh, worldwide uh, between uh, end of May, end of April and uh, May. So the experts uh, requested to provide opinions, suggestions, and concerns in the questionnaire. Uh, WCTR analyzed the, the survey results. So the, it found the uh, reality of uh, the lock, lockdown and the uh, restrictions of uh, stay home activities and the physical distan distancing requirements and others. So I stopped first message, but I'll provide the link to the WCTR website in the chat box after my presentation. So the next uh, uh, message is uh, uh, how we need adjust sustainable transport solution. So in this regard, uh, I would like to comment on the uh, new normal. So that is uh, with COVID-19. You know the, the new normal will be very different uh, from the normal before pandemic. Some would say it could be more car dependent. Uh, others say uh, the, it's a major opportunity for more virtual communication to, to replace a longer trip. This is clearly unique and rare opportunity for policymakers and transport practitioners to work together, right? So it's really good chance to change our life toward more SDGs and sustainable life and work. So I believe this is how we seek for forward-looking transport solution. So this is uh, my second message. So finally, a uh, small announcement. So UNCRD uh, organized a regional environmental sustainable transport forum in November. So here uh, we discuss uh, this kind of topic. So um, it will be very good chance to share ideas in relation to COVID-19. So a priest or, or your uh, participation. Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Endo. Uh, thank you very much to all panelists and discussants. And without further ado, we are going to start our uh, second panel, Innovative Transport uh, Solutions to Accelerate Recovery and Support Achievement of SDGs and Climate Action. We have two speakers and two discussants on this panel, and I'm, I'm cognizant of the time because we also have a, another uh, session with uh, several interventions. So uh, I really be counting on the support of my panelists and discussants to keep to the time or even uh, shorter if at all possible. First, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Mohamed Mezgani, Secretary General of the International Association of Public Transport, UITP. Mr. Mezgani, please, you have the floor, sir. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me and for inviting UITP to participate in this panel. UITP is the International Association of Public Transport. It has been established 135 years ago in Brussels and uh, gathering 1,800 public transport organizations from 100 countries. I try to answer three questions uh, very quickly. The first one is how uh, will we need to adjust sustainable transport solutions in response and uh, recovery periods? So speaking about mobility and sustainable transport solutions, there are uh, uh, key lessons we, we draw from this crisis. The first one is that public transport is an essential service. Uh, during the lockdown, public transport services have been maintained uh, despite the reduction in travel demand to ensure distancing, but also and especially to keep service continuity for the essential workers and for those who have no choice than uh, traveling by public transport. So in other words, the uh, coronavirus crisis has proven how fundamental to a city public transport is. And we are proud of our members, the guardians of mobility that kept operating public transport during the crisis. The second lesson is that we all have seen these uh, empty streets and roads uh, during the lockdown uh, and the huge space reserved for cars. Therefore, we should resist the temptation of very short-term solutions that will encourage people to leap back into their cars. So car traffic nuisances in terms of pollution, and you know it, it, it is causing 8 million premature deaths per year, this pollution, the greenhouse gas emission road accidents with an annual uh, uh, death toll of 1.2 billion uh, and the congestion. Unfortunately, all these nuisances, they haven't disappeared with the crisis. They are still there. And we should also not forget that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. 
So according to the World Health Organization, poor air quality worsens the impact of the virus. So it's important to, to act, and we must seize this historical opportunity uh, to start over and shape the future of uh, our cities towards back to better mobility. So UITP, of course, is uh, putting a focus on that, and we have published recently uh, a policy brief uh, which is entitled Cities for People, Public Transport for Better Lives. We are also leading a communication campaign about that, and we see six key priorities. First is that we have to rethink cities for people and not for vehicles. Second is that public transport should be the backbone of the mobility system because it's space and energy efficient, it is safe and it is for all. Uh, and it's the only one mode which is accessible for all. Third is that we have to restrict the movement of cars by introducing congestion charging, uh, controlling parking, by also giving the priority to the active mode, to uh, cycling, to walking, of course. Uh, we need to have agile regulatory uh, framework for mobility. So uh, have flexible flexibility and contractual relationship to let the, the public transport operators change their operating scheme when there are crises like this one and not be binded by contractual uh, arrangement. Uh, also, we need to make it possible to combine public transport with the new mobility services like car sharing, ride hailing, on-demand transport to offer a uh, solution to the, to, the, to the citizens that will uh, make them travel without the, the need of owning a car. And, and we need to have also travel demand uh, management measures to limit crowds and to better manage the peak in, uh, in mobility. And the last uh, aspect is about having a positive communication to restore trust and not contradictory communication like we have seen by some government, and I would like to, to come to that. So uh, th these are the, 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 the main aspects I would like to mention for this first question on how to build back better mobility. The second question is about uh, the opportunities and, uh, and uh, what would be the role of the stakeholders in this context. So we have uh, public transport is a complex system and we have many stakeholders. And so that's why it's very important that we have a coordination and we have a governance system that is more agile and, and giving more, more, more freedom to the, to the public transport operators to organize their, their system and also more possibility to integrate between the different modes uh, of transport, as I said uh, earlier. And the last aspect is about the role of science and technology. And of course, science is important. Science is key. And what we have seen, unfortunately, is that some governments are taking uh, the decisions about uh, calling people to avoid public transport without any scientific evidence about that. And this is not acceptable at all. We need to really to listen to the science and, 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 uh, uh, but the, 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 and, and build our policy, uh, policy decisions based on that and based on the scientific uh, evidence. So to conclude, I would say that really we need to, to have a, 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 a transport system which is moving people instead of moving cars. And this is only with that that we can build back better mobility. Thank you very much for offering me this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Meskani. Uh, and next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Thomas Deloison, Director of Mobility at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD, to speak. Mr. Deloison, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Nayara, and good morning and good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to the World Business Council to express our views on what can be done to recover better from uh, the COVID-19. I'll start to say that I think the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the economic crisis that is following is probably the unmistakable opportunity we all have to shift collectively to sustainable mobility. We have seen COVID accelerating some of the existing trains um, in, the, in transport and opening new pathways uh, uh, in cities and, and beyond. Uh, but it puts a lot of distress on, on the various systems, uh, whether they are economic or social. So let's really, I'd like to invite everyone here to embark on a journey for a more uh, uh, inclusive, a cleaner and resilient mobility all to do collaboratively. And, and what we really uh, believe is, is the priority is to continue to decarbonize transport and facilitate the adoption of low emission vehicles and low emission modes. And obviously it starts by uh, focusing on the vehicles where freight, maritime and aviation are now showing some signs of 
of available technologies that could be implemented in a foreseeable future, and we need to grasp these opportunities, um, maybe by encouraging uh, stakeholders across the system to recognize the true cost of these modes, the true cost including environmental cost and, and also social cost. Another element uh, linked to the vehicles, and we should not forget, are the batteries. Batteries for electric vehicles or um, the hydrogen uh, uh, fuel tanks and fuel cells, including uh, their infrastructure, uh, are new technologies, and we need to look at those and put them on the right track and avoid externalities, um, as we may have seen with previous technologies, uh, like, like was just mentioned by my colleague. We also need to focus on infrastructure when it comes to electrification of vehicles and uh, accelerate the deployment where it's already started, but most importantly, make it future-proof and include in the thinking and the planning the needs of the emerging uh, patterns of transport, namely the fleet operators, um, the, the ride sharing and hailing, to name just a couple of them, but also from a logistics perspective, uh, what needs to be done in, uh, in, the, in the perspective of shared freight and, uh, and shared fleet. To make it simple, I think we only have one chance. We need to embrace the planning of the infrastructure and the development of the technologies for decarbonization right first time, because we will not have a, a second chance to achieve the Paris Agreement. The second direction that I'd like to propose for, for uh, uh, perspectives and, and thinking is really to, to, to consider how to leverage the opportunities of digitalization and data, which really is about embracing collaboration between the public and the private sector, which is essential to enable data sharing models, which are trustable, which are operational, which are adaptable for the creation of shared value, value that is, in, that is shared between the all the stakeholders providing inclusivity, resilience, and equity. There are honestly a myriad of opportunities related to digitalization and, and data sharing. Um, and we can take those opportunities to align, as I said, the, the, the pathway to, to a sustainable uh, pathway of, for, for transport. First step will obviously to make sure that we support this work uh, by research, um, as we still need to prove the correlations between data sharing, what it can do, and the actual impact it can have um, through operational pilots. And this is probably the first step, but maybe just to mention a couple of examples. On the transport of people to drive um, more accessibility, more efficiency and safety, as it was mentioned by one of the colleagues before, multimodality is essential, and we can reduce the number of, of cars uh, and, and have um, people moving to more sustainable and active modes, for example, by embracing digital multimodality. We can also think about providing better accessibility by integrating informal transport uh, means and modes with those who are more um, uh, established or, or, as mentioned by my colleague, those which are the backbone of developed uh, economies such as public transit. We will also consider, for example, uh, new ways of gaining revenues and creating benefits for cities by considering vehicle access and congestion pricing, as it's often mentioned, and that offers uh, a really a lot of opportunities for revenue and for, uh, uh, and for better uh, livable cities. Maybe concluding on the transport of goods, uh, which is obviously uh, uh, an enormous amount of the passenger kilometers which are uh, driven. We need to find here resilience and efficiency. This can be done by uh, creating uh, data sharing for shared freight platforms and enabling better capacity management. It can also be done in urban environment by managing better the curb and the space that is used by the logistics. So these were just a couple of examples, dear colleagues, to um, help you to consider the two priorities that we think need to be uh, at the forefront of, uh, of our uh, recovery. One, decarbonization, and second, the opportunities uh, related to uh, data sharing and digitalization. Thank you very much for your time.
Thank you very much, Mr. DeLoyson. Now I would like to invite our two discussants for their interventions, and each of you will have uh, three minutes uh, or less, if you can. Uh, first, let me uh, invite just move the slide. Uh, Ms. Georgie Gerben, uh, Senior Maritime Policy Advisor at the Executive Office of the Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, IMO. Mrs. Gerben, please do have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to reflect on the inspiring discussions from the maritime perspective. Um, as you mentioned, I'm representing here the International Maritime Organization, which is the UN specialized agency and global regulator of the various maritime shipping industry. Uh, in direct response to COVID-19, IMO has over the past month been working closely in partnership with national governments, the shipping industry, um, to make sure that global supply chains do not come to an absolute standstill. If COVID-19 told us one thing, it is the actual necessity of partnership, which will continue to be key also for a long-term sustainable recovery, with more collaboration needed both across the supply chain, between ships and ports, UN agencies, especially around specific opportunities offered by digitalization and the carbonization of which my final member just uh, talked about once. We are already witnessing uh, new cooperation initiatives from Denmark to Chile, bringing together ship owners, ports, airports, logistics, and trucking companies to jointly invest in local renewable hydrogen production that can serve all of the involved transport modes. New investments in the large scale deployment of low carbon fuel infrastructure. For example, in port areas, which are model hubs, can provide a momentum to also speed up the carbonization of other transport sectors. In relation to LDCs and speeds, we have seen great potential of building synergies between merchant shipping and smaller terrestrial energy grids to support local renewable generation, energy security, and resilience with better and fuel technology. COVID 19, with no doubt, brings a great opportunity to see the transition to renewable use in transport in a systematic manner, specifically for maritime transport to move towards a decarbonized future of shipping in line with the IMO DAG strategy, and also of our World Maritime Day theme 2020, Sustainable Shipping for Sustainable Planet. This transition, though, won't be easy. It requires further research and development, which is focused on innovative ship design, alternative fuels, and opportunities offered by digitalization. It also requires a huge investment, particularly in renewable energy infrastructure development, that the maritime industry will not be able to secure itself, especially now when priority for many ship owners will be in a post COVID 19 world to sustain business. New partnerships will be just needed more than ever to overcome both the research and development and the investment gap. We've heard before the need for collaboration and cooperation by many of the speakers. We are all in this together, and from the side of IMO, we are eager to build further partnerships towards the sustainable future of transport, and we are ready to provide a global platform to promote R&D in zero carbon mining fuels and to bring together the wider maritime community, the UN system, private and development, development bank, and other interested donors to move together to this direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Gerben. Uh, the next uh, discussant on this panel is Ms. Jane Hugh, Deputy Director Environment at the Air Transport Bureau of ECAO. Ms. Hugh, please, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So the International Civilization Organization, ICAO, is pleased to be part of the discussion this morning, and I'd like to start by thanking you and Dessa for the invitation. So COVID-19 has had a significant negative impact on international air transport, with ICAO forecasting global international aviation capacity in 2020 
to be down by 63%, and airlines losing up to $400 billion of revenue in 2020. The full impact of COVID-19 on international TV aviation is not yet clear, and consequences for states and airlines around the world may differ. But all, in all regions, are being significantly impacted. When aviation is impacted, world connectivity, tourism, and trade of goods and services are directly impacted, and more so for the most vulnerable. COVID affects a basic right of humanity, the right to come and go. The COVID-19 and the global slowdown of aviation will cause a substantial reduction in CO2 emissions from aviation in 2020, and in all likelihood in 2021 as well. The focus of this address is to show the impact of COVID on aviation climate action and some opportunities. Over the last few years, the global march to tackle climate change has been unwavering. The Paris Agreement, the Global Agreement on Corsia, the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, and the Kigali Agreement to the Montreal Protocol are the three main pillars that underpin a global transformation to a far safer and more prosperous planet. Together, the triptych of agreement is a testament of the importance placed on climate change by the international community. ICAO's Corsia was the first ever global market-based measures to address CO2 emissions from a sector. Together with the Montreal Protocol, it complements the level of ambition set by the Paris Agreement with the NDCs. The implementation of Corsia is well underway. In 2018, the ICAO Council adopted the standards for international aviation CO2 emissions monitoring reporting and verification. These are contained in an annex of our Chicago Convention, which is the Convention on International Civil Aviation. Thanks to this robust MRD system from 1st January 2019, all aircraft operating on international routes are being monitored for their CO2 emissions. From 2020, every year, third-party verified carbon emissions inventories are reported by states to the ICAO Central Registry. The Corsia Central Registry is the CCR. Along with the timely implementation by all states and airlines, the success of Corsia is demonstrated by the fact that today 87 states, representing approximately 80% of international aviation activity, voluntarily participate in Corsia from its outset. Very recently, Afghanistan, Madagascar, Kazakhstan and Rwanda announced their intention to voluntarily participate on course of setting requirements from its pilot phase. And more states are soon expected to announce participation. Ms. Hugh, uh, I will ask you to wrap up, please. The level of participation was possible thanks to an unprecedented assistance capacity building and training program at course that was put in place under the spirit of ICAO's No Country Left Behind. We have a partnership there for 130 donor and recipient states in all regions. So 10 years ago, when we decided on course, that, that was to be a gap filler. But most importantly, what we were looking forward was technologies for in-sector reduction. So the use of the best Available technology on aircraft will be ensured by applying the ICAO Global CO2 certification standards that we adopted in 2017. And by 2022, we are seeing so much new technologies coming in. We are expecting hybrid and electric aircraft entering into service for shorter routes. We Thank you. First, Thank you so much, Mrs. Hughes. We really need to wrap up. Really? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, and, but thank you. And just a note, uh, other speakers have also used a little No, uh, I'm sorry, you were a, a discussion, so it was a three minutes, but we uh, please do send your notes because those are very interesting and we will be able to incorporate them on the summary. Thank you so much for that and apologies for, uh, for interrupting you. Uh, 
we are uh, now moving to our the interactive dialogue and where we have interventions from uh, stakeholders from different uh, sectors. So during the registration process, some of you indicated your intention to speak on behalf of your organizations and selected speakers from different constituencies will now be invited to take take the floor. Considering that we are uh, a little uh, short in terms of timing, I will really need the collaboration of all speakers to limit your interventions to one minute and a half, maximum two minutes. And unfortunately, I will need to intervene in case this uh, you extend your interventions. You can send a longer version to my colleagues. We will be compiling them and making sure that they are uh, posted online and they are featured in the summary of this uh, webinar. So um, without, and I'm, I'm showing on the screen the key questions that the interventionists will be uh, addressing. And so without further ado, let me invite uh, the speakers. Uh, I will mention the three that I have in order so that you are prepared. We will start with His Excellency Mr. Mohammad uh, Naimi, the uh, Deputy Permanent Representative uh, of the Permanent Mission of Afghanistan to the UN. Then uh, he will be followed by Mr. Yarob Badr, Regional Advisor on Transport and Logistics at the Economic Development and Integration Division at UNESCO followed by Ms. Hali Diao um, from Shenzhen Bus Group in China. So I will start with uh, uh, Ambassador Naemi. Please, you have the floor, sir. Ambassador? I think he left, Nayara. We can move to the next speaker. Okay, so thank you so much. So, um, Mr. Yarov Nadar from UNESCO, you have two minutes. Thank you, I activated my stopwatch. Uh, ESCOA is a regional commission covering now 20 Arab countries out of the 22 of the League of Arab States. Uh, let, dear colleagues, I think that in these difficult times, uh, we are discovering the interest of not only some relatively new tools like the ICT and the versions e-versions of the peer uh, CMR and similar agreements, but also of the more traditional instruments like the National Transport and Trade Facilitation Committee, which if activated and empowered, could help harmonizing and coordinating the actions and measures undertaken at the national level to keep transport network and borders operational while containing the further spread of COVID-19 pandemics. But of course, it seems that further efforts are needed to coordinate this mechanism at the regional and global levels. Second and last point, on the digitalization side, and already before the COVID crisis, at UNESCO, we designed a project on technology and innovation for developing land transport in the Arab region in 2019 with the intention to inform on the status of applications of conventional, emerging, and future digital technologies and their benefit for the land transport system. By emerging and future digital technologies, we are focusing on what we call the big five, Internet of Things, big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and blockchain. The project is now under implementation, and we highly appreciate receiving any suggestions or lessons learned from similar initiatives. I see that I have a few seconds just to thank our uh, colleagues in DESA for giving us this opportunity to contribute to this fruitful exchange, and thank you all for your kind attention. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Badr. Uh, so I, I will mention the next three that I have. So uh, Ms. Hali Liao, followed by Mr. Thiago uh, Herrick de Sa, uh, and Ms. Kekashan Basu. I will be introducing you and your titles. Uh, so the first one, Ms. Hali Liao, Head of International Development Department uh, from the Shenzhen Bus Group in China. Ms. Liao, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Shenzhen Bus Group, we are the largest transport, uh, new energy transport group in the world. Uh, we operate a full 
electric fleet of 7,000 electric buses and 5,000 electric taxis in Shenzhen, which is one of the biggest cities in China. And um, actually, since the COVID-19 broke out uh, in Wuhan in January, uh, because we were operating on a full electric fleet, our air and quality was greatly improved in the last few years. So actually, there has been, um, we, we can see there is a good effect on sort of the diminishing, uh, on the impact for people who uh, contracted COVID-19 here. And we've only had 400 cases, and we have been in recovery mode since February in China. And now we have not seen a locally transmitted cases uh, for the last 130 days. And throughout this, as a public transit operator, actually, we have been seeing opportunities on our on-demand services, uh, uh, which is a joint service where we pick up people that um, directly from residential area to CBD areas to decrease, you know, interpersonal contact and um, with more social distancing practicing on the buses. And obviously there is more stringent, you know, cleaning, uh, disinfectant service, all of that being introduced on the bus and taxis as well. And we are also coming up with new services such as, you know, putting, having taxis to pick up school children um, in, in Shenzhen and, and in other cities as well. So while we are seeing a great impact on public transportation as our ridership has been, are still only at 50% to 60% of our us usual passenger load compared to last year, we are actively looking into more opportunities in this time where um, people need more reliable, cleaned, and um, efficient transport system to get around in, in the next coming months and even till, till the next year. So, thank thank yeah, so. you so much, Ms. Liao. Um, so moving forward, and apologies if I have to interrupt you, colleagues. Um, uh, we have Mr. Uh, Tiago de Sa, followed by Ms. Kekashan Basu, followed by Mr. Jeremy Anderson. Uh, so first, let me give the floor to Mr. Tiago Herrick de Sa, Technical Officer of Urban Health, Transport and Health at WHO. Uh, Mr. Dessa, you have the floor. Thank you, Nayara, and uh, you and Dessa colleagues for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. I speak uh, from the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health at the World Health Organization headquarters. And I would perhaps focus my intervention on, on two aspects from the three I was planning to address, because I think much has been said already on the adjustments transport systems you know, need to make to recover and respond to COVID. I think what we have witnessed in this crisis is that in countries and cities with more sustainable transport systems, meaning systems with strong walking and cycling infrastructure and culture, strong public transport, little reliance on private vehicles, less polluting fleet, and good travel demand management, which are all not only healthy, as we know from, from the evidence, but also required much less adjustment and seems to have responded and recovered much more efficiently to the pandemics, while also being more resilient to this economic stress. So I think this is a very important point because it highlights the opportunity, but at the same time, the urgent need for all the different stakeholders involved in the transport arena, including the health sector, to better incorporate uh, health and well-being considerations while developing, running, monitoring, and financing trust systems, not only accounting for the externalities, air pollution, road traffic injuries, but also the many benefits transport can deliver for health, in particular for pandemics like the one we face now, but also for the uh, pandemics of non-communicable diseases that we face. Uh, not to mention the fundamental role of transport in addressing health equity and universal health coverage. Very quick point from my side, WHO has just published a manifesto for a healthy recovery from COVID, which I invite you all to have a look at, and we are now working on actions from those, that manifesto that can help cities and countries 
uh, to move forward more efficiently for a healthier future. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Desai. If you can uh, also share the link to the manifesto on the chat box, that would be great. Um, follow, uh, then the next, we have Kekashan Basu, followed by Jeremy Anderson, followed by Mr. Holger Daukman. Uh, Mrs. Kekashan Basu, founder, Green Hope Foundation, you have the floor and you have two minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Your Excellency, good morning from Toronto, Canada. My name is Keheksha. I am the Founder President of Green Hope Foundation that is working at a grassroots level in developing nations with marginalized communities in both urban and rural settings. But the opportunities for sustainable transport in these regions are almost non-existent and therefore the possibilities are huge in both the consumer and commercial spaces. And as we come out of the pandemic pause, the process of Building Back Better provides a unique scope for discarding fossil fuel driven transport systems and evolve to clean energy solutions in keeping with SDG target 9.1 that seeks to improve infrastructure that supports economic activity and human well-being while promoting sustainability. Sustainable transport requires infrastructure and LDCs, which are anyway struggling for resources, will need the support of the international community that should ideally be in the form of development-linked investment. There is both an opportunity and need to establish circular economy solutions that support local innovations in establishing renewable energy-driven transport. And the biggest challenge is to create a demand for sustainable transport solutions. It needs to be made economically viable for entities that will operate it. And multilateral cooperation that allows transfer of technology, resources, and investment between developing, developed nations and the global south will be the key to build sustainable transport solutions. Finally, in order to build inclusive growth, sustainable transport systems are going to play a critical role so that those at the bottom of the economic pyramid don't spend nearly half of their income on transport that is unsafe and unhealthy, not only for themselves, but for everybody else. I thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Basu. Uh, next, Mr. Jeremy Anderson, Sustainable Transport Lead at the International Transport Workers Federation. You have the floor, sir. Thank you for the invitation to speak. And uh, at the ITF, uh, we represent 20 million transport workers in 150 countries. And we believe that rebuilding after COVID-19 must involve a just transition to a zero carbon sector. We need a globally coordinated green industrial policy that mobilizes high investment and full unionized employment. This requires an economy-wide approach, including investment in renewable electricity and alternative fuels. And we need governments to play a leading role to anchor the zero carbon transport sector with publicly owned infrastructure and services. A just transition for workers is an essential element of this process. Workers must have their livelihoods protected and not be made to pay for the transition. We need a greater role for workers in decision-making at all levels of our companies and industries, and much fairer opportunities for women workers, young workers, and workers of color. It's important that we strengthen the workers' voice in multilateral institutions as well. The ITF is building strong partnerships with the C40 Cities uh, Group, for example, uh, such as the program to introduce kind of zero emissions buses by 2025. And it's also really important that the revised NDCs for COP26 include kind of concrete plans on a just transition to transport. Although aviation and maritime were not included in the Paris Agreement uh, internationally, we need to make sure that there's a robust framework for the transition to zero carbon in these sectors. COVID-19 has presented significant challenges to the sustainable transport agenda. It's also shown the importance of dialogue with trade unions for finding solutions to this, these challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Uh, our final uh, intervention um, is for Mr. from Mr. Holger Dalkman, founder and CEO of Sustain 2030. Uh, Mr. Dalkman, you have the floor, please. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First, really thank those for allowing me to 
to, to provide the short intervention on behalf of the high volume transport program, which is funded by the Department for International uh, Development UK. So we recently analyzed the international transport community responses to COVID-19. I'd like to share so some of the findings. There is an active international transport community, particularly in high income countries, uh, developing case studies, providing guidance and others as, uh, as we saw as in the transport sector. Uh, however, we are also lacking specific information on low-income countries, such as uh, the impactors on the informal transport sector. At the same time, we don't see coordinated plans to boost transport programs related to decarbonization or sustainable development goals as, a, as coming together from the international community. So therefore, so we suggest there's an action plan uh, to come up with a common platform for collecting and disseminating information and research findings. We encourage us to mobilize findings to allow transport to respond to COVID-19. And as former speakers said, align that also to climate change and SDG, as well as building also the foundations to uh, paying more attention to future education and capacity building agenda. As we know, so the pandemic is global in nature and we need also truly global common action. So we encourage current efforts to increase and uh, call us for launch of a coalition uh, within existing or newly built alliances because we need also clearer voices so that decision makers on the ground can access those knowledge. You'll find us more information uh, on the website I provided and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mr. Dockman, and to all our colleagues for keeping to time. And, and please do share. If you have longer interventions, just share with my colleagues, and we will be working on them for the summary and posting online. So uh, we are now, uh, we have now reached the closing session of our uh, webinar series. And this, the, those have been uh, many valuable inputs. We are very thankful to all the speakers, the panelists, those, have, those who have made interventions, and to all participants for joining the call. As mentioned in the beginning, all materials and the recording of the session will be available on our website. Um, also, on behalf of you and us, so we want to thank all those who responded to the survey that we made available uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the contents are now being uh, under analysis and the answers will be used for DASA's future work on the topic. And we might get in touch with you to receive more, de more details and information. Um, I would like to thank all uh, the participants again. A special thanks to my colleagues who supported in, in organizing this call. There is a team of us uh, working on this. The webinar is now closed. Thank you very much. Until next time.